Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's Writers Chat. And this is where writers like to gather together, talk about all things writing for writers and by writers. And so we're really glad you're with us today. We have part two of a tool that's pretty complex, and we're going to get kind of dive into the deep side of it today. And thanks to Brandy for sharing with us today. And it kind of wets our whistle. Got me curious to kind of reopen and learn this uh this tool again so brandy i'm going to make give you the full time because i know you have lots and lots and lots to share with us and we said just before we started the recording she wants to present most of the time and then we'll have answers right towards the end we'll so most of us will go off camera and then towards the end we'll hop everybody back on for some questions that way she can get through the meat of everything so brandy anything else you want to say before we go off camera or you want to just take it away no, I'll just take it. Yay. All right. <laughs> Thanks. You got it all in a little bit. Thank you, Brandy. You're welcome. Uh, this is a large program. We are talking about Scrivener today, and I will be presenting the Mac version, which is Scrivener 3. There is a Windows version that's a little bit older than what I will be presenting, and there are some notable differences. I can't speak to all of them, but there are several people that um, have noted them uh, since uh, the last uh, chat. Um, so. I guess there will be an update to this particular um, version of Windows Scrivener. Um, not exactly sure when it's coming, but Scrivener is a program by Literature and Latte. You can buy it for $49. There is a 30-day free trial, and that is full usage trial. So that means you get the full program, but you also get to try it for 30 usage days, not just consecutive days. So that's a really great thing. And if you happen to participate in NaNoWriMo, usually they have a 50% off if you win any one of the NaNoWriMo events. So really great thing thing. This is going to um, get a little bit more into Scrivener. I'm going to pop something in the chat real quick. Um, it's just going to give the pretty much what I just said, plus the link to where to find it. It is literatureandlatte.com is where you'll find Scrivener. And with that, I am going to start sharing my screen. Now, please note that I am not an expert. I might sound like it. I'm not really I just am sharing what I have learned as I have used this program. And this is really a huge program. So I am not going to be able to get into everything. I will try to get into what I think is the most useful for writers. And then if you have questions, you can ask them at the conclusion of this presentation, or you can reach me at brandy at brandybro.com. That's B R A N D. I B R O W dot com, and I will answer questions as well as I can. So I'm now sharing my screen. Um, can you tell me? Somebody tell me if you see my screen, just to make sure we're good. You're good. Awesome. Okay, this is the opening page for Scrivener, and I'm going to open what we worked on last week, which was a brand new project that we labeled sample. So I'm going to go to open recent. And here is sample.scriv. I'm going to click on that. And here it is. So for those of you that were here last week, this will look familiar. We got to see how terrible my typing skills are. <laughs> and uh, we made some folders and some files. And this here is the research folder. One of the things that was talked about is how to use the research folder. Well, the secret is that the research folder is really not very much of a big secret. It's just a regular file folder. I should say a folder rather than a file for Scrivener um, because this is basically a folder that is just one of the preset ones in the program that you cannot delete. And it's unique in that, well, I guess it's not really unique. The draft folder is the more unique one in that you can only put in text files, but research and any other folder that you create outside of the draft folder, you can put any kind of media in. So you can add in a URL. Last week we brought in um, this image and you can drag in other files. I'm going to go to my finder and I'm gonna go to my desktop. That's not desktop. And I'm going to drag in this and I'm going to put it right in here. What is this? This is a mind map from Literature and Latte's 
scalpel program and you can put it right in here. You can drag in, I'm gonna grab something. I have another, Ooh, this is my music program. I'm gonna put it off screen. I'm just gonna grab a media file. It is, Ooh, did it go in here? Ooh, get back here, peeky boo. And okay, it's gonna be a bum. So <laughs> sometimes you have to do things a different way. So you can go over here and this is the inspector, see? And then you can add things in there. You can go up here and you can import files. So we can import a file here, this way. All right, so by the way, the uh, text file, um, it's actually a media file. It does drag in. It's just, I don't wanna spend too much time trying to put it in there when there was so much to go over, but it, will, it does work. It probably will work better if it was on the same screen. Um, I'm going to open a new program. Let me get rid of, excuse me, I have my little toolbar thingy. Move this thing off. It's the screen sharing toolbar that I don't want on my main screen so I can see everything. Okay, so I'm going to open a, another program. Um, it's actually, they have a little setting here, favorite projects. You can add projects that you're regularly in into this area and it's right here, the tutorial. But I also wanna show you, if you go to the help menu, here are the help the Scrivener manual right here, the interactive tutorial. You can reset the tutorial after you have kind of dabbled in it. And there are video tutorials that will take you off um, to their website where you can watch videos. So I'm going to open the interactive tutorial. And here it is. And so that I can toggle things back and forth easy, I'm going to go to window and I'm going to merge all windows. And if you notice, there's the sample one here and the tutorial here. Now this always kind of messing me up a little bit. The one that you're working on is a light gray. I, my brain likes to think that, oh, I'm working on it's gonna be dark gray. Now from, it's backwards for how my brain thinks. Maybe you guys will get it just fine, but that's kind of how I think. So this is the tutorial and it tells you Lots and lots of things. So a lot of how I learned Scrivener was reading through this tutorial and playing around with it. So you'll see down here, give you an example. Here is an audio file, kind of like I was trying to drag in that I failed at, but you can put it in here. And it will play. So you can put in all kinds of things into the research area. What's really great about research um, in Scrivener is that there are a lot of places that you can put this stuff. So over here, you see this here, this is called the bookmark. You click on it and there's not a whole lot here. There's a thing here, start here, which is this file right here. So when they set this up, they put this into the bookmarks. Bookmarks is also over here on the inspector on this little bookmarky thing here. And this section right here, see there's up and down arrows. You click on it and there's a document bookmark or a project bookmark. Project bookmark is pretty much, you can put any bookmark in that you want the entire project to access no matter where you are over here in your binder, no matter what file is up on your editor. If you, want to work just with research on a particular part of your project, you can make bookmarks only for that particular document and it will show up in the section. A document that is set to here, we'll, I'll show you a document bookmark. We're going to drag this searching one over and we're gonna drag it to here. And now you'll see that searching from over here is referenced directly in the lower part and it's a document bookmark. Now, if I go up here under bookmarks, you will not see it here because it was set just for this particular piece that you're working on. If you change this to project bookmark, you will not see that in projects either. 
So if you want it to be applicable to projects, you want to be in the project bookmark area, drag this over here, and it will add it. And then you will see it up there. And then you'll be able to find it wherever you want to go. If you click on that here, oops, get back here. It will put it right in the editor. See this? So click here, put it in the editor. All right. If you want to delete a bookmark, this little dash here deletes it. So um, undo doesn't really work on deleting a bookmark, just to note that. But if you put it there once, you can just drag it there again. It's pretty easy. You can add bookmarks through this little gear section. You can add an internal bookmark from any file that is in your binder, or you can add an external bookmark. External bookmarks are often URLs, usually URLs. You can see if you click it, it comes up. Scrivener. Hey, look, Brandy can type today for the moment. So now you see that it's here and there's a load web page. I'm going to make this a little bigger so it's easier to see. You click this and it automatically loads Scrivener's web page right in this section here. And just a note, say if you were to put in uh, something that's password protected like Facebook, if for some reason you logged out, it will show up with the sign up screen. If you're logged in, I think it will put you right in there. I'm not going to test it out now, but um, I have seen that. Uh, for example, I had uh, dragged in um, a bookmark with the chat from last week's um, writer's chat. And initially, the chat text showed it was a URL. And then it registered later when I closed out and came back that I wasn't logged in. So I just had the login screen. So that's a good thing to know. But this is an open web page, and it will change according to whatever's on the website. And then you can add. Oh, and you'll see we're in project bookmarks. The Scrivener is here. You go up to bookmarks here, Scrivener is here. If you click it there, that's there. You click this here and it actually, if you double click it, it will actually bring up the website in your web browser, which it just did on my other screen that you guys couldn't see. And then is add an external file mark. I'm gonna click that. I'm going to go back to my desktop and I'm going to grab that mind map again, click it, open it, and it puts it here in my project bookmarks as well. And there it is, easy to access. Now we're going to shift a little bit away from the bookmarks. We'll come back to that in a little bit in a different section. And we're gonna check out this view button here. And um, which means I'm going to make this a little smaller. Maybe I'm going to, there we go. Here's the view button, upper left corner. If you click it, you'll, have op you'll see options. You can hide your binder completely. You can show your binder in case you accidentally hit it and go, oh no, I need that back. You can hide your format bar. You can show the ruler, which is that. I usually don't use it, but I'm over here because I wanted to show you show collections. So you click this and above the binder opens up a collection area. What is a collection? Well, you can select any number of these and I'm holding down my command button and just clicking random ones. I click those and then click the plus button and it automatically put all of those I just selected into a collection by itself. And then you can title it. You can select the binder to look at the binder or you can go back up to your collection. It will show just what's in your collection and then your editor will change based on what is in here. Now these I selected folders that were empty. Otherwise you would see text if I had a brain more of a brain, I would have put in something with text where you would see the text. But yeah, this one C does have some text. So all of these would show what you want. And then if you want to get rid of the binder, I mean, get rid of the collection, you hide the collection. Same thing with um, what was with the bookmarks over here, the negative 
the hyphen thing here, you click it, delete title it collection. Yes, so you can delete a collection as well. So there is your collection. I'm gonna leave that there for now so that you can see it and just kind of log in your brain about where it is and where it came from. Now we're gonna do something that is kind of interesting. This is layouts. And you'll see that there are different ways to set your screen. So here is the default layout, what we've been looking at. This will allow you how to have three panes, gives you a little window. This one here lets you look at a cork board, an outline. This one here is dual navigation. Oh my goodness, what is this? Well, this is showing something that is called a split screen and I'll show you how to do that. We're gonna go back to the default page. So you can really see that all of this um, is really customizable to how you best work or wanna work in any given project. So this little button right here is a split screen window. If you go up to, where is it? Do, 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 do. Find where I'm going. Up here somewhere. I'm having a brain cramp at the moment. Aha. It's looking at it. Aha. View. Editor layout. Right now it says no split. You can split it horizontally or you can split it vertically. I'm going to split it horizontally. Now you have two editors, one up here, one down here. This little button here would do the same thing. I'm going to close this one here. It puts it back to the single window and I will select this again. Now you notice when this is closed because I had opened it in horizontally, Scrivener remembers what it was. So this is now showing a split horizontally, whereas before, if you noticed, it showed it going up and down vertically. There's a little trick to that. Um, with the Mac program, you can press the Alt uh, Option button and you can toggle it right when you want to click it. So if I want to click it and split it vertically, I can do that. Now, if you notice, when I had these before, I clicked this again to close the second window. What you want to do is you want to click on the window you want to keep. You are not clicking the one you want to close out. So you click it and you keep this one. Now I'm going to split this again because I want to show you how you can move around in here. If you go over here, you can press this. Whichever one that you are selected on, which happens to be blue here, you will see the text. Then if you want to go over here and change it to a different text over here, you select this and then select the different one you want in the binder. Well, another thing you could do is drag it to the header on either one that will work. What happens if you want to work on just one and leave the other one so that you don't accidentally get rid of it? Well, you can go up to the header I'm going to go onto the side because there's more text here and you right click it. Not with it selected. Get out of there. Okay. You right click it and then down here you see lock in place. So you click that and you notice how this changes to a red color or reddish pink. So now if I click over here, it's only changing, only changing the other editor. So this one won't change. It will leave it there and then you will work in this one. You can go back over here and you deselect it to let it go so that you can work in either of them. Now there's an additional space that you can use. Let me check my time here. Um, and that is, it's called the copy holder. So it's an additional space on your screen. In order to do this, you're going to, there's probably another way, a way up to do it in the menu. Um, and I don't remember right now, the easiest way to do it is to hold your option button down, click this and drag it to the header bar and let it go. And you'll see all of a sudden, this is now split again. This is a quick reference panel that is anchored to your editor. What is a quick reference panel? Let me show you. Right up here, there's a little button that says quick reference. 
I'm going to click on this right here. Let me get text here. Here's text. And I'm going to click this quick reference here. And it pops out your file in its own window. To close it, you can just exit out. Another thing about this is you'll notice here, this little panel down here, it's not fully featured. It doesn't have its own editor. This one will, I mean, it doesn't have its own um, inspector. Um, but this little button here, if you click it, it will pop this out into a quick reference panel, which is why I say that the copy holder and it see it's, it took it out of there and it put it into the own window. So that's why I say the copy holder is pretty much like a quick reference panel just anchored to your screen. Now I have this and if I, maybe I want to make another one. So I can click over here, select this in the binder. If I hit the space bar, oh, you know what? I'm on the same one. It's not gonna give me another, let me get a different one. Okay, now if I hit the space bar, it gives me another window. It's actually another. So you can have as many quick reference panels as you need to work where you want. Now I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller. Now I said I was gonna come back to bookmarks and that's because this little button down here is a bookmark icon. If I click it, I will see the bookmarks for the project that we had put in earlier. And you'll be able to access them in the quick reference panel. And I'm going, you can add to them and take away from them here as well. I'm going to close this out because it is almost 25 after 11 and I'm a little bit behind. So I want to move on to the cork board. I'm going to close this one and I'm going to go to cork board. Here's the cork board. Now you notice I'm in a text file and it is blank. It shows nothing. That's because cork board needs groups to work. Click on a folder and here are groups and you get index cards. Now, where does this text come from here in the index card? If you click over here in the editor, it's in the synopsis area here. If I go to here and I type something, it shows up in the synopsis area. The corkboard here, down here, this is the arranged mode. So if you take one of these and you move it, it just moved it over here in your binder. So now I have the get oriented, the get it out there. If I want to put it back, I put it over here and it moves it back over here. So if you change the order here in the arranged mode, it will change the order in your binder. If you go down here and click this other button, this is the free form mode. I can move this all around anywhere I want to, and it will not change the order of the binder. This lets you kind of think on a page and figure out where you might want to put it. If you decide you reorganize something and you like the way it's reorganized, then you come down here and this little button, which would be bigger if I had a set a little bigger, you would click commit and it would bring this up and it would tell you which way you want, if how you wanted to set it. If you decide you don't want to do it, you cancel that, but you don't click commit unless you want to change the order here. To go back to the regular order, you go to the arrange mode. This button right to the right down on the bottom here has corkboard options. You can change the size of your card. You can change the spacing in between how many cards across. With corkboard, you can select um, using command on a Windows, it would be control. You can select multiple groups and it will populate your editor. So you have the first set here, down here you have the next set of folders and then down here you have the third set of folders and it will show those. Now, if you notice these buttons down here have changed, you can arrange them horizontally so that you can see them a little bit better this way or you can change them to view them vertically. So there are a lot of different options for how to use the cork board. Let me just double check my notes and see if there's anything else I wanted to show you in cork board before long. Ah, yes, color coding. You will see there are no color codings here. This button down here, it looks like it's got a line. You'll click on it and you will see all kinds of colors. These colors are labels that were set in the tutorial. So if I right click on, let's see, 
I had to get out of all those. If I right click on this, you'll see this little label section here and they have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. These are the basic labels and you can rename them if you go to the edit button and put them to whatever you want. If you're working on um, a novel and you have different characters, you can assign different colors to your characters. So you can rename it, say Marjorie and give her a lime green Color. You can change not only the title, but you can change the color that goes along with your title. Then you will go back to your index cards, and these would be rearranged so that the index cards that you set for your different characters would show up on the different color lines. And you can also change how the color lines appear. So these buttons, you, you can do horizontal or vertical, depending upon what you want to do. Uh, let's see, we're going to go to um, the outliner. And uh, let me see. Uh -huh. Before I go to the outliner, I'm going to open um, a different project. This is one that is mine personally. I work on it. I'm going to use my favorite project to open it because I have it in here a lot. It's submissions log. I'll open this and I'm going to merge all my windows so we can toggle easily between them. And here is the submissions log in this tab right over here. Sample is back here. We're going to close that actually because we're not going to work in that anymore today. And then we have the tutorial and the submissions log. Now you see the tutorial, not very much here. If we go over to the, my submissions log and I click on the outliner, oh, I'm sorry, the corkboard, and I click on fiction submissions, you'll see there is a color. That's because I labeled it something. And over here, it has all different kinds of stuff. Uh, it should have the label in here. Where's my label? It's in here somewhere. I'm short on time, so I'm not going to try and find it. Ah, down here at the bottom. See, it says fiction, and you can toggle labels. Now, if I click on my lines, you'll see up oh, where is this card? Well, if I scroll this way, woo, I have a lot of colors because I have a lot of labels. It's way over here on the fiction line. Fiction in this, we have um, buy markets, the flash fiction, that's the card that's over there, the short stories and the poetry. You'll notice this is the order here and the binder puts the cards in the order as well. So um, markets is first in the binder and then flash fiction, but because it's fiction on the fiction label, it's way over here. If I had less labels with less colors, it would be closer together. But no, I'm not that simple. <laughs> so there are the colors. Um, and real quickly, you can go up to yep, view. And you can choose where to put your color. So you can use the label called in the outline of row. You can label, put your labels in the binder. Um, and you can put it, you can put it on your icons. I don't like to do that because it changes the color of my icons. Uh, you can put it on the scrivening uh, titles, um, which is when all of your group of texts are together and you see them all on one file on in the editor. And or you can put it right on the index card as well. And I click that and whoo, it made the entire index card the label color. So a lot of different options there. Uh, for my sanity <laughs> for the minute, I'm just going to deselect the index card and I'm going to where is it? Deselect the binder just so I'm not seeing extra colors I'm not used to. All right, we are going to go to the outliner. The outliner is super cool. Check this out. This is the outline mode. You can outline a novel with it, but this is my submissions log. And so I track markets. You can see I have grants, contests, markets, market listings. And so I'm beginning to collect 
my own markets that I want to write for, and I'm making my own market listing in here. And I've labeled some of these, which is why I have so many labels. Um, not only do I have fiction for my submissions and not fiction for all of that, but I have color codes of labels for, oh, is it paying? Is it non-paying? Does it pay with an anthology? So that's what's here. Now, all these colors might look a little bit um, overwhelming. I have set my colors to show up in my outliner, which is why you'll see this whole line is red for non-paying. It might be a little less confusing if I did it a different way. I don't know. I'm kind of working around and changing things on this. Um, but this is um, a pretty interesting way to work with things. Now, if I go to the group mode, well, we did that already, actually. Um, ah, yes, that's what I wanted to do. If you go over here, you will see things to do. This little taggy here is where the metadata is. And you'll see I've already made some custom metadata. I have a market, submitted, responded, response, word count. This particular um, story actually has something here, it says under consideration. Um, actually, I don't know if it's that story, that's not where I am. Uh, whatever I do have selected in here, somewhere. Um, now what's cool about these is that if you right click on this header for this, you can change or add to the columns that are in here. And this metadata that I put over here is now available here. I can add the market. I can right click and add when I submitted it. I can add responded. Um, so there are a lot of different things you can do. I'm going to add a new metadata. I want to add, I'm looking at my notes here. I want to add a list, I believe. I did this last week and I haven't gotten back to it because I've been so busy. I had taxes in the middle of the week. Um, so I want to add a list and I have, oh, these are my lists here because this is the market, um, but I want to make a new one. So I'm going to click the new button. No, I don't, I don't want to make a new button on that. Okay, I'm going to cancel out of that and try again. I want this plus button up here because I want to add a new metadata here. I don't want to change right now the market. If I wanted to add a market here, I would click this button, but I want to add a new one. And I want it to be, it gives you options, text, checks, box, list date. I want a list. And this right here is what will show before you select something. Um, but I'm gonna put the title and um, I'm gonna put a uh, payment. I wanna know what kind of payment there is. So under this metadata, I'm gonna click this now and I'm going to click paying. Click it again, non-paying. Click it one more time, pay, pays with anthology. And then I'm, I'm gonna leave none here. Actually, I'm gonna put three dashes and I'm gonna select okay. Now over here, there is a payment option and I click these and I can say, oh, now I have options. So if I go to the 24 hour short story contest, there's no option for pay if you win. But for now, I'm just going to write non-paying. And it doesn't show up here. It's in the metadata, but it doesn't show up here. So I'm going to right click up here and I'm going to find my payment. It's right here, click it. And now it will show here and I can widen these out as I need and it will show that the market is non-paying. So there is a lot that you can do with this. The outliner also has a feature where you can export your data, the outliner data. So you go to file, you go to export. You can export it as a regular file, um, but if you want to use it in a spreadsheet, 
then you would export the outliner contents as CSV. And you do that and then you go into your spreadsheet uh, program and it loads it right all on spreadsheet so you have all your data. Oh, the other cool thing, if you go over here, you have your labels here, you can, just like a spreadsheet, sort your outline, <clears throat> outline um, data by these columns and it does not change the binder. It just sorts it over here in the outliner. So it works in a lot of ways like a spreadsheet, um, but it keeps all of your information in a different, you know, in with all this other stuff. So a lot of really cool things to do. Let me check my time. It's 1137. And I got through what I wanted to with the outliner. I want to show you, I'm going to go over here and I want to show you some cool writer tools. Down here, where are we? Oh, this is Scrivening's mode. See, it has more than one file with a dotted line. I'm just going to deselect it to just give me a regular editor here. And I'm just going to click on one. Down here, this little bullseye is a word count target for a particular document. If you want to write, say you aren't working on something for a day, you want to write 300 words in that document, type in your words. You can type in a minimum target, how much you want to allow for an overrun. If at all, you can show your overrun. You click OK, and that bullseye down there changes to a bar. And now because there's 300 words in this document, <clears throat> excuse me, it says there's a green bar. If I put in 30,000 words, <laughs> there's a tiny little bit of green there. It's not very far. So that is the word count document um, for the document. There is a project document up here on project, project document, a project word count. Um, so you select project, you show project targets, and then it lets you set a target for your entire project. And it will, it shows you how many words are in this particular thing. And I believe it counts um, what's in your draft folder. And since I renamed all of these, I'm not sure which one is my draft folder yet, but I don't use the word count for this, but for another project, um, you like my archives of dead stories. <laughs> yeah, I also have like a bad story market to bad one to write for. Uh, um, so you can set your project target here as well. And then it will show a similar bar. You allows you to set a session target. It gives you options so that you can um, have a draft target, a session target. It lets you set the days of the week. Um, allow writing on a day of the deadline. This is useful for when you are um, working now in You can set your 50,000 words. It will automatically tally your word counts. So this is a really great feature for writers to use, um, or especially if you're a writer that likes to write with a quota every day, that will be helpful. Uh, statistics up here, you select this and it will show you all your statistics selected documents. You can select several of them and it will show you which one. I think this one is currently on the Elizabeth George Foundation grant and it will give you a whole bunch of rundown and options. So just to let you know that this is here. Um, what else we got? Writing tools over here on the edit. This is pretty cool. Come down here. Let me select something. You can select the word applicant click on writing tools and you can look up the dictionary, uh, look it up in the dictionary, find uh, something in the thesaurus. If you want, there's applicant, thesaurus, Wikipedia, Apple, gives you options there. Also, you can search. There's a linguistic focus. This is really cool. It lets you focus on different parts of the speech. How many words in this particular document are nouns? it will gray out everything else and just show you the nouns. How many are pronouns? How many are adverbs? Very good if you want to avoid certain words or certain types of words. Um, and it lets you set how, how big the fade is on this. 
Also in writing tools, very cool feature. If you're not great with coming up with names, you click on the name generator and it gives you all kinds of really cool options. Let's go down here and gee, we can find all kinds of different names. You can set obscurity, you can set the forename, the surname, you can attempt alliteration. Um, we'll try a female version. We'll go to Irish names and we'll generate. And boom, Nicole Nurse, Julie Jardine, Tia Tyne. If you wanna get rid of the alliteration, do it again, Charmaine Berry. Alyssa Wilson. So really cool features and you can change them up. Um, love that feature. All right, time, 1142, my goodness. A uh, couple of important things you need to know up here. Uh, project settings, very important to know because in here um, you have your section types, your label list um, status. You can change things in there. You would change if you wanna change your default formatting this here lets you do it. Um, you can set a background image, <clears throat> excuse me, for your composition mode, the one where it blacks at everything and you just have, have that page with your text. You can actually put an image on the back of that. Um, it shows you where you wanna set your backup. Um, but special folders is important. This here um, lets you set a template folder. So right now there's no template folder. Um, I'm actually gonna scoot over to the tutorial real quick. Down here, there's no template folder either. We are going to go to project, project settings, special folders, and I'm going to select one. Down here is sheets. I'm going to select sheets right here, and I'm gonna select okay. And now this little folder has a T on it. That means that these two things here are now templates. And so I can go into a folder, a page, let's see, just want a regular, oh, I'm in a cork board. So I want to add um, to this, so I can click this little carrot here, and it, now it lets me add a character sheet or a location sheet um, automatically as a template. So that was not there before. I would have showed you if I remembered that it wasn't there before. Um, I can give you an ex uh, well, let's see, over in my submissions log, if I select add, um, there's no template here because I don't have a template folder set. You can also uh, select the folder and then you can go up to, let's see. Do, 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 do. Default template for sub documents is on documents. And then you can select a default template for this. Right now, it is set just to plain old text. I want to change this to a character sheet. So now, if I'm in here and I click the plus button, it automatically puts in the template, the character sheet for me to work on. So that's how templates are useful. Preferences. This is the other important thing right here. Um, so right on Scrivener and preferences, this sets your preferences for the entire Scrivener program. It gives you options here for how to do things, um, how you wanna set things for editing, gives you options. My default text zoom right now is 150. I can set it to 200 and it gets bigger. Um, it was really tiny. I set it to that so that when I go into a screen, it wasn't automatically tiny, 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 like it tends to be. Uh, you can change the formatting. Uh, you can change the colors on revisions. Yes, it does have a revisions mode. I don't work with it much, um, and so I can't really speak to it much right now. Um, behaviors, you can change how Scrivener acts when you things. You can change the appearance. Um, I can go to the outliner. I can change the group titles to a different color. I can change the font to a different color. Um, I'm short on time. I would do that if I had time to show you how cool it is, but I don't. You can change what you want for corrections. You can, right here is where you would use smart quotes in new projects. So if you want all of your documents to contain smart quotes, you would select it. Sharing and backup. Um, so there are those, what time is it? It is 11.47. 
And my last thing I want to show you real quick, this is really Ben Oland. There's so much that I could share with you, but um, customizations, um, really cool thing. You can change the icons that you see over here so you don't have just boring old folders and pages. I'm gonna right click this and down here it says change icon. And I have a lot more icons than um, it would standard uh, pretty much come with. There is a way in here to load your icons. You say have tons of people, um, GIFs, books. Um, so you can select these, but I will show you, this is really cool, text-based icon. You can create an icon from text. So way up here, icon from text. And this little smiley face here, it gives you all your emojis, all that really cool stuff, plus some extra things. And I'm just going to put a cheer and we select OK. And now my folder is no longer a folder. It's a little cheer icon. So you can do that with all your icons. If you noticed over on my submissions log, I have different icons for my folders so that I can tell at a glance, because I'm such a visual person, um, what those folders are. It really helps me out with that. Um, and then lastly, back over here on file, <clears throat> excuse me, on Scrivener, the Scrivener right here, there is appearance. Right now I haven't set it to light. My whole computer, <clears throat> excuse me, is set, is in dark mode, but I have Scrivener set to light, um, but you can change it to dark and it will change your whole appearance. Um, or, and you have the option whether or not to keep your editor light. Um, and then you can change the whole theme. Um, let's try purple haze. Give it a minute. Where are you? Oh, actually purple haze is really close to what I have, I guess. <laughs> I'm gonna change my, my theme. So then there's this one, different colored themes. And then um, one more thing. And then I will take questions because it is that time. I'm going to keep this theme for now because I kind of like it. If I right click on my toolbar up here, I can customize the toolbar. Here are a bunch of buttons that you can drag. You can see I have focus here, focus is here, and typewriter. These are two things I dragged. If I don't want it here, I can take it out or I can put it back. You can put whole bars there and you can choose down here whether you want just the icon, only the text or both. I prefer both because sometimes I forget what things mean. Uh, so that is my <clears throat> whirlwind tour of a little bit more in-depth of Scrivener. And I am going to stop sharing for now. So I actually hit mark in 10 minutes of 12 and I would love to hear any questions you have, as I'm sure there was a lot. This is kind of like drinking from a fire hose <laughs> with this program. And I mean, I could uh, give a whole class just on customizing uh, the interface for your viewing pleasure. <laughs> well, come on in, everybody. You can join us or you could speak up. I didn't, I know there's been some questions off and on in the chat. Well, this is your time to ask them. Melissa, did you have a question? Did I see you posted a question or did you gather a question? It seemed like there was one I just saw a little bit ago. Do you have one some, to start us with? There were some before a comment and after one that I made. That, um, I, I think you actually ended up answering it in your presentation, but I'll scroll back and check for sure. I know um, both Jill and um, Kathy had um, asked questions. I'm trying to find them. You said something about automatic template adding with a question mark. Oh, it was a comment. Exactly. I just love that aspect yeah. that you could automatically add templates. Okay. Yeah, and those a lot okay. of the okay. templates that are there, you, you can just make what will work for you. Um, like that whole submissions log is something that I created. Um, one thing I didn't open and I forgot to open, I can, we have enough time. I can go back to screen sharing. I can show you um, like if I open a, um, a template, a preset template, what a preset template looks like instead of just a blank um, project to work with. Uh, that will give you a little bit of an idea. Although um, 
Well, the tutorial kind of gave you a little bit of an idea, but um, there is one like the nonfiction uh, template or the fiction template. It will actually have a whole book manuscript um, where it can help you compile into the submission manuscript you want to use. And a lot of those will come uh, with character templates. Also, you can find Scrivener templates on the internet. Um, I think Rochelle Gardner has one for fiction writing. Um, I grabbed that one, I put that in and she, she has like a whole outline for putting in your pinch points and this and that, things that you can follow for your writing. So do a search for Scrivener templates so that you don't have to start with a basic template and somebody else has already done a lot of the work for setting up, which you're most likely going to use. Um, I, found I have a question. question. Oh. Uh, Brandy, just a quick question. Sure. I loved that editor tools where it had uh, the parts of speech and mm -hmm. you could figure out, okay. Um, I, I'm, I understand that verbs are like so powerful and nouns. So is there a, a, an aspect of that that gives the number of nouns and the number of verbs? Um, that's a good question. I'm going to, while we're on screen here, I'm going to pull it up, drag it over to my other screen and look. <laughs> that way I don't have to go off screen. Writing tools. Oh, it would help if I actually selected something with text in it. Let's see. Oh, you know what? Um, yes, at the bottom, it will show how many, like if I click uh, direct speech, it will say a, a number and then quotes or nouns, a number, like two nouns. So yes, the bottom of that linguistic focus window does count how many are in there. So then you could get a percentage of how many verbs you've used in a... Uh, yeah, you could, uh, yep. Okay. Thank you. Definitely, good question. Can you tell I'm an accountant? <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, um, Kathy's question earlier was, uh, could you put websites such as Word Hippo, my favorite, in the project document bookmark to access them quicker? Yeah. Yes, but if you want to use them, then you would click on it and it would take you to a web browser to use. You can scroll and you can read, but I don't think you can actually use the website unless you go to the web browser. I must say you all are doing amazing without like <laughs> not having tons and tons and tons of questions with all of this, this stuff. Yeah. But, and maybe some of you are just in shock. <laughs> Me. The, the colors I, and the icons are really cute too. That I, I did not know it did all that. That was amazing. Yeah, yeah. The, I, the customization aspect is one of my favorite things because I'm such a visual person. You can change the color of your editor in the background. You can change, um, you can put in, originally I had super fancy <laughs> font. I was gonna show you the font and the outliner, but I'm like, oh, I wish that you could change it just for a project and not your entire interface. Um, that would be really cool. Um, and you probably can, I just haven't figured out yet how to do it. <laughs> and uh, Brandy, I have another question. If no one else does, I don't want to hog the time. Go ahead. Um, looking at the big picture, what is the difference between the way a nonfiction writer and a fiction writer uses Scrivener? Um, that's not, that wasn't really my question. Really, my question is, uh, can nonfiction writers, do they have a separate set of tips and hints that they love? Um, I don't know. I think there's a different way to use it. I can tell you that there is a bibliography um, and citation feature in there. You can attach um, some kind of um, citation bibliography scripting in there to help you with references. I haven't done it because I tend to do mine manually, um, but I know that is in there. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is completely useful for nonfiction as well as, as fiction. I, I tend to use it for both. I actually will use Scrivener to track um, my daughter's medical records. And I've created a whole medical record file for my dad uh, when I was his caregiver. 
So yeah, you can use it for all kinds of things. I had templates for the doctors he saw, the contact information, medicine, all of that stuff. So absolutely. Thank you. I was interested in what you said earlier, or maybe someone said it in the chat about using, it's almost like it puts Word and Excel together because I, some of the things that you do, I've got like Excel work, worksheets, like that's how I do my characters and timelines and so forth. Mm -hmm. But it was really interesting to see, yeah, that is a combination of, of those two things and thinking about two very complicated manuscripts I have that were NaNoWriMo projects that just sort of went nowhere because the plots were complicated and there were holes and all of that. And wondering if something like Scrivener might be the answer to figuring mm -hmm. those out. So that this was very, very helpful. I might have to do NaNoWriMo in November just so I can get that halfway. <laughs> <laughs> Which I well, I will, say, do, so. <laughs> I will say their scalpel program, the what the mind mapping one with all the um, boxes and connectors um, is a huge help along with that because you can create entire timelines and the page just expands and expands and you can yeah. just keep putting your boxes and your lines wherever you need them. Um, so that's like a huge supplement. And then you, as you saw, you can bookmark it in your Scrivener project to access and view at the same time. That's great. It was a lot. And, and I'm wondering if people you know, you might just want to say in the chat, are you like more interested in it? Was it too overwhelming? So less interested in it. And then Isabel says that she use as, uses a different program called, she considers um, Scrivener Lite. What was it called? I just thought Scrapbook online. Do you want to say anything about that, Isabel? Like um, where, you found, where you found it or how someone could get that? Uh it's just that I saw in, um, uh, some videos about uh, writers who said that they were using this one. And there's another one called Write Control. And both have been designed by French, uh, I believe, um, the name is Joseph Kafka, the one from Scribble. Uh, he designed it for himself because he was a writer and he thought Scrivener uh, didn't suit him he said i'm going to create my own so he puts a light version for free and mm -hmm. if you want an expanded version then you can pay and have more stuff and the other one called write control it's a lady who was a writer and her husband designed uh the sort of light for her and what they say they offer the site uh, for free but if you want to print it or to export it then you pay a tiny mm. fee and they can also um, have the like if you want to self-publish that you can also uh, hire them as your publisher okay. and that's then something else so mm. I've, I've used both but uh the screen book uh, i quite like it i may have the link by the way so this link would be my page, my dashboard, but um, it's here. Okay, uh, thank you. And it's, you can really? use, use it to pile up all sorts of things. And they also have, uh, in Scribbook, they have pre-organized uh, settings. So you can have a pre-organized uh, snowflakes method. You have also the pre-organized NaNoWriMo, which is the 30 days of November. Um, and you have different templates. So you either you say, you, you mean that you start a new project and you organize it the way you want. Either you just um, take one of the templates and I think you, you ha can have something like eight or nine books and then you've reached the full capacity, but then you delete and create new projects. Yeah. It's a free, free alternative. Amazing. Thank Lots you. That's there. amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Brandy, this was phenomenal. Thank you so much for all that you shared and just all, I mean, it's complicated, but, but it is such, such a good tool and such a um what i want to say the words escaping me flexible i mean you can use it like you were saying just for so many different yeah. things 
Flexibility is wonderful. And I think I said last time, I know someone who does all of her blog posts first in Scrivener. She writes yep. them all. That way she keeps track of them too. She can easily tell what she's already written about, what she's already done. You know, it's just is a really nice place to put, put them all together. So there's lots of things that, that you can do. It's just like, you know, whatever your imagination comes up with, you can probably do it in Scrivener. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, this is taking a lot of time too. So Brandy, we really, really appreciate it. And it was helpful because this is the type of tool I think sometimes we're more afraid of. So this yeah. kind of introduced us to dip our toe in it, which is great. Do you want to say a little bit about next week's too? It's Cynthia on agents and publishing. I think you were the contact for that. Uh, yeah. Um, Cynthia Rookty will be here next week sharing about what is going on in the publishing industry from an editor's perspective. And she is a great person and definitely a show to catch. Yeah. And anytime we have an update on what's going on in the industry, especially by an age yeah. who's got a lot of times insight, a different point of view than us, I think it'll be extremely, extremely valuable. So we're going to be indebted to Brand. Andy, once again, because she yeah. was our contact with Cynthia. And, and she's from Books and Such that. Literary Agency. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. stuff. You'll do the intro next week. I'm making that <laughs> assumption, right? <laughs> we hadn't talked about yeah, it, but thing. I guess. <laughs> we hadn't talked about that. There you go. One last thing on that. All right. Thank you on that. So uh, let's wrap up the recording and then we'll invite everybody to stay afterwards if they want to do any sharing or additional questions. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again, Brandy, for that today. And we'll see you all next week on Writer's Chat. Bye now. Bye. Bye.